They usually say the show is not over until the fat lady sings, but the fat lady's going to start this show. <laughs> I got to make apologies too before I start because I've got another engagement at 3:30. I've got to be back in Danville, so I'm going to have to scoot as soon as I get off stage. So I want to thank everybody for inviting me here. I really respected Larry and. The song, the, the second song I'm going to sing is Because of Him. He wanted me to write about Kayford Mountain, but I realized that the battle is about all of our mountains here and not just Kayford. So uh, for two years, the man hounded me to write this, that song, and he finally got his way. And then for another year, he hounded me to come up on his mountain and sing it. He got his way that time, too. So, but I've not had the opportunity to be back. But... Um, Hopefully, this will make up for that. <clears throat> there is a bomb in Gilead that to me. Oh, 
a sinner. blast you all through the doors back there. Dear friends and fellow keepers of the mountains, Reverend Stevens is dealing with an emergency and is unable to be with us this afternoon. He sends his best wishes for the afternoon. And I am Reverend Rose Eddington of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are now all keepers of the mountain. 
We are gathered here to pay our tributes of love and respect to the great and inspiring keeper of our mountains, our friend, Larry Gibson. May our time together this afternoon be filled with memories of this wonderful friend and champion for justice, who such a short time ago walked with us and blessed us with his presence. His too early departure leaves us saddened and grieving. It is hard to let him go, to return him back to the great sea of life. He was our friend, and he was friend to the earth and to the mountains and the streams. He was a friend so great that we have plunged into a grief as deep as was his greatness to us. Yet in the midst of our grief, we are uplifted in spirit because of the many memories we share and because of his courageous living. It is good for us to be here together. In times when we face death and loss, we need one another for understanding and support. Just to be together, to look into one another's faces, takes away some of our loneliness and draws our hearts together in the healing we can offer one another. At such times, the various faiths that sustain us come together in a harmony that cuts across all creeds and assures of the permanence of human goodness and hope. I first met Larry back in 1998 and we became instant friends. A mountain lover myself, I joined him for part of his walk across the state. His courage and passion touched my soul. One day we found ourselves talking about death and the death threats he had received. We managed to get a little lighthearted about it and I jokingly said if anything happened to him not to worry, I was pretty good at putting together funerals. And his reply was, well, don't be in no hurry. That was years ago and I wasn't in no hurry then and it's something I never wanted to be in no hurry for. Oh, Larry, none of us was in a hurry for you to go. I hoped, we all hoped your time to die would be a long time coming. We wanted to keep you on as chief of the mountain keepers. We wanted your infectious spirit to keep us inspired. You've left us with a hole in our hearts and a hole in the fabric of justice that we have to figure out how to patch up. You even made a hole in the sky when you took off like a blue hand chicken. Now it may sound like an odd thing to compare, to say something about a blue hand chicken, but the blue hand chicken is an old American idiom for a rare and wonderful thing or person. The poet Vincent McHugh says, the blue hen's chickens, the salt of the world. Gone, gone, the good ones. The ones who tore a hole in the sky and climbed through it. The ones who could do anything. The big ones, the blue hen's chickens, the salt of the world. And yes, Larry was a big one, huge in spirit. And he was the salt of the earth. Think about it. We sprinkle salt on our food to make it tastier and more savory. That's what Larry's life did. He made life more savory and more worthwhile. Salt is a necessity for our lives. When you don't have salt, nothing is more precious. And Larry was the salt of the earth. And now he is dissolved into the great ocean of life that contains us all. We miss him greatly, his fun, his laughter and jokes, his love of life, his ability to draw out our passions, his compassion. But the savor he brought, his unique brand of saltiness, will always stay with us. To quote Shakespeare, we shall not look upon his like again. Because he was so impactful, our lives are not the same. And this is how it should be. Larry was not expendable. The same words Adlai Stevenson said of Eleanor Roosevelt apply to Larry. We are lonelier. Someone has gone from our life who was like the certainty of refuge. 
and someone has gone from the world who is like a certainty of honor. Well, there have been two songs running through my head comforting me since Larry's death. The first is based on Psalm 121. It begins, unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes. When I sing it, I can see Larry standing on Cayford Mountain, mountain, looking up with longing eyes for the hills that are no longer there. The Bible verse it comes from says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my strength. How can we mountain people be strong without our hills? Larry knew that our strength, our help, comes from the heavens and the earth, from good people and the spirits of the mountains and our hollers. And the other comforting song makes me smile and gives my spirit a lift. It's Harry Belafonte's Calypso, Turn the World Around. And this is the verse that especially calls up Larry for me. We come from the mountain, living on the mountain, go back to the mountain, turn the world around. That's Larry, coming from his mountain, leaving his mountain to work in Cleveland, returning to his mountain, and turning the world around. That little Calypso song ties it all together. Water makes the river, river wash the mountain, fire makes the sunlight, turn the world around. Heart is of the river, body is the mountain, spirit is the sunlight, turn the world around. We are of the spirit, truly of the spirit, only can the spirit turn the world around. We call upon Larry's spirit and the spirit of life as we continue the work to turn the world around, to make saving mountains and streams and life itself the normal thing to do. We will turn the world around. Larry stood up for justice, reached out, brought us together, touched us all. So as I close, I invite you to reach out and take the hand of your neighbor for just a few seconds before we move on with our celebration of his life. Could you just reach out and take the hand of your neighbor? Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it is a tree which stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it is a long way from here. Hold on to my hand, even when I have gone away from you. Holy Spirit of life and of love, may your presence be with us as we remember and celebrate our friend and favorite mountain keeper, Larry Gibson. Amen. the lady with the numbers tell me when to sit down and shut up okay thank you uh, well my name is Bill DePaulo and uh, among other things I was Larry's lawyer and uh, getting ready and, I, and I've never given a eulogy before to, about anybody anywhere uh, and this kind of reminds me of the situation when I sat down with Larry to fill out his application for a 501c3 exemption from, so we could collect money and he realized in the middle of this, you know, he says, have you ever done this before? And his eyes were kind of bugging out of his head. And I said, nope. But I said, but, you know, it'll be over soon, which is kind of like my eulogy. It'll be over soon. And, and my and I is going to sing what I'm claiming is a Keeper of the Mountains fight song afterwards. So it gets better. That's all. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, this is a sad occasion by anybody's standard, but I want, I think we should all keep one overriding thought in mind, and that is that it's not a tragedy to die where you want to be, doing what you want to do uh, with the people whom you love and surrounded by people who love you. 
So on September 9th, when Larry died, frankly, he was as happy as a man can get. He's at the zenith of his life, life's work preserving uh, Caford Mountain, and that, of course, what he did not know was the end of a life that had taken him from, I mean, total, complete, absolute obscurity to a, a cowboy that if you typed his name in the Google, you'd get 194,000 hits in about a third of a second. You know, manifestly, somebody. Um, but uh, to quote that great uh, philosopher from Steubenville, you know, you're nobody until somebody loves you. And uh, Carol, uh, you made Larry somebody like he'd never been before in his life. And uh, he knew that. Uh, nobody was more happily married in the last years of his life than Larry. And, and he didn't need anybody to explain to him uh, the luck he'd had drawing to uh, the most important inside straight of his life. So from those of us who knew Larry before he knew Carol, thank you, Mom, Carol. And again, even though this is a, a sad occasion, you know, if it involves Larry Gibson, it ought to have at least an occasional laugh uh, because, you know, I frankly think Larry's laughing. I mean, he sort of has the last laugh here. When you think about it, I mean, look around, and, and uh, if you don't know the person next to you, you know, I, it might be worthwhile to say, where are you from? And, you know, you'll get some predictable answers. We've got, I'm sure there'll be a lot of folks from Raleigh, and McDowell County, and Mingo. And there'll be people from New York and Washington, both of them, and San Francisco and Texas. And if, you know, if you, if you really push your luck here, you'll meet people from Russia and Istanbul, and if you're even luckier than that, you'll meet somebody from Ecuador, uh, which is where Larry uh, took me when I, I stole Carol's ticket to Ecuador at the end of December 2010, uh, because Larry went down there with Mitch Anderson of Amazon Watch to explore the eastern province of Ecuador, which a quarter century of exploitation by Texaco oil had left basically as a, as a wasteland. And that's really important from Larry's point of view because it, it was a tremendous growth opportunity for him, but it also underscored what he really was for a lot of us, and that was an opportunity for us to grow. Um, so, in my judgment, Larry is, is, has got the last lap, because look around you, and ask yourself how many native sons who are politicians in this state would have this many people show up voluntarily with no political agenda for tomorrow from such great distances. And I think there, there are very few people that meet that criteria. Um, and the other aspect of it is Larry's life was started out with a, he couldn't have started out with a bigger odds against you making it. Uh, beginning, born with total poverty, outside of money, no inside connections anywhere. Um, and as he would say it later, he had one knack all through his life, starting right from the beginning, and that was he was a publicist's dream. Uh, he used to brag that even as a child, and before he was a year old, he managed to get his name in the newspaper in Charleston, and he did that by what is in reality, a very, very unfortunate and unattractive episode, but he was bitten by a rat in his crib. And everybody just wailed and moaned about this, but I took the position that given what was going to come down the road with, in Larry's life, that was preparation. And uh, then he later, at some, another point in his life, uh, when the sort of the vicissitudes of uh, the coal industry's economy, kicked his family back and forth from Cleveland. He, he and his family ended up living for a brief time under a large willow tree. Well, it never bothered Larry. Uh, I mean, he thought, I mean, he was outside, certainly beat that stupid crib. And, uh, and he was as, you know, as happy as any to the manor born aristocrat because that was his version of Downton Abbey. And it was, it was 
pretty darn good. Uh, he, he, there's also, I'm sure a lot of you have learned things about Larry in the last uh, couple weeks that you didn't know before. One of the chapters of his life that I always encouraged him as his lawyer to kind of downplay in his public pronouncements was his life in Youngstown, Ohio. Which, and then, you know, the, the best thing you could say about his life there was he was a young punk. And then the most respectable business that he was in was driving a cab uh, in a town which Youngstown is described in many ways, but you'll never hear the word genteel associated with Youngstown. Uh, uh, I'm trying to keep this under an hour, so. <laughs> but in, Lung in Youngstown, there he learned a, a, a sort of a, an upgraded set of survival skills, which were really necessary for him uh, to come back to West Virginia and do what he did. Uh, he never let uh, school get in the way of his education, as they say, and he, he went to the school of really hard knocks in, um, in Youngstown. Uh, so, but those are the, sort of the, the deep recesses of his life and what he did after he got back to West Virginia in 1986 is, is frankly pretty well known. But when Larry came home, because his formal education had managed to skip everything after the third grade, he, uh, I mean, you have to ask yourself, who would have put money on Larry Gibson versus the coal industry in 1986? And the short answer is nobody, nobody, at least nobody who approached that question rationally. But of course, that didn't include Larry Gibson, you know, rational in your dreams. He, he was clueless on one major topic, and that is that he didn't have a chance against the accumulated wealth and power that he was coming up against. But in his uh, excited and animated ignorance, he just declared war. And, and it wasn't David versus Goliath, it was more David versus Goliath and Company International Inc. and affiliated entities. So he, uh, but the, the coal industry had one great shortcoming also. Uh, there was nothing in their background, or every, I should say everything in their background, like, suggested to them that they could take care of Larry Gibson with a fly swatter. You know, I mean, who's he? And the short answer was that was in their dreams. Uh, because they never encountered anybody as ready for a war as was Larry Gibson. I mean, if you had fended off rats in a crib and slept comfortably under a willow tree and survived the urban warfare of Youngstown, a bunch of overpaid co-executives were themselves flyweights. So. I, uh, uh, I'm not particularly proud to say, but it's the truth, so I'll kind of admit it. I mean, I know some co-executives, and when I was sort of just casually mentioned that, well, yeah, I know Larry Gibson. And as a matter of fact, uh, I actually consider him a friend, and I do some work for him. Well, you know, they, they kind of foam a little bit, and then out would come their real feelings. They said, get him off that mountain. That was the overriding objectives they had at the time, and, and it is to this day, okay? Because they, uh, they knew that he, um, he represented something they couldn't withstand, and that was public scrutiny. That is, if, uh, um, you know, most mountaintop removal sites you frankly can't get to, you have to be flown in with a helicopter, but if you were a journalist and at Le Monde or the Spiegel or the Guardian or the New York Times, you could fly into Jaeger Airport, which was frankly the hardest part of the trip, and then get, you know, rent a car down Greenbrier, go out exit 99, get off at exit 79, and if you follow your nose long enough, you're going to be on top of Caver Mountain. And you'd get up there and you'd look out and you would see this vast wasteland uh, that had displaced mountains that had been there for 480 million years. And in their uh, sort of unwitting genius, uh, the coal industry had 
ceded to Larry the most important thing in any conflict, and that's the high ground. But as they had lowered the mountains around him a thousand feet, we left him in the catbird seat so he could get up there and he could see everything that they had done. And people from all over the world came up there to see what they had done. And uh, after a while, many and more and more thousands of them asked the simplest question on earth, you know, why? Why would somebody come tear down these mountains? And then you would get, you know, these lame, uh, pathetic, long-winded answers, kind of like my speech here, that, that when you analyze it, you realize they're, they're doing all this for one purpose, and that is to boil water. Boil water to turn a turbine to send electrons out of here. Well, 99% of our electricity in West Virginia is generated by coal. We export two-thirds of the 90 million megawatts a year that we produce. So that's two-thirds or so. In other words, we live on less than a third of it, but we absorb 100% of the uh, environmental uh, brunt that goes with it. Uh, the, and what, what's the legacy of the coal industry? They keep, you know, they keep telling us we need to destroy the priceless mountains that uh, Larry protected uh, so we get the short-term gain of, uh, uh, of the most dangerous, low-paying job in the world. Uh, and, and all of this was to sustain peak loads in cities along the East Coast, like a little town called Washington, D.C. And of course, they measure peak load by mid-August, why? Because it's hot. And so what we're, what we're really saying, we're destroying mountains in West Virginia so that bureaucrats in offices in Washington, D.C. in August don't have an interruption to their air conditioning. I mean, if that doesn't make you ask why, then you need to go back to some version of morality school. So Larry's answer to all that was real simple, was just stop. You know, we've done enough of that. Uh, and for purposes of any ongoing dialogue, if you will, with the coal industry, there's really just basically one thing to say, and that is, uh, he's up there now, and he is an insider for the first time of his life on that mountain. Uh, and, uh, you know, he and leaving. They're, they're, you don't have the financial or other resources to get him off that mountain. Uh, and Larry left basically, you know, he defended his ancestors' birthplace and resting place all through his life. And he's now left that job with us. So we sort of just have to ask ourselves, um, are we are, are we up to that? You know, can we protect uh, Larry Gibson's birthplace, the place where he lived and died, and where he where he uh, sleeps today? Uh, I, um, um, you know, his his uh, gospel was simple. You know, love him or leave him, the mountains, but just don't destroy him. And, and you have to ask yourselves, you know, are we going to become keepers of the mountains too? And he's up there, and I can feel him watching. Uh, and we all need to ask that question. Will we become, like Larry, a keeper?
Friends of Larry Gibson, I first met Larry a quarter of a century ago, and for the first moment that we talked, I could feel the emotion, even if I am 98 years old, I feel with full of love and devotion to the same things that Larry Gibson stood for, truth and justice. We had an immediate attraction because we knew instinctively that we both stood for the same principles of truth and justice. 
We did not call it anti, not top removal. We just could feel in our hearts that we were both fighting for truth and justice, which increased year by year. And that's why I'm here to say today that Larry Gibson will live forever in our hearts. Yes. Larry expects us to stand up for the same principles that he fought for. And we promise you, Larry, that we will never give up. Never, never, never give up. So let each of us, as we go forth today, remember the challenge that he has made. Never, never, never give up. We're not saying goodbye to you, Larry, because you will be with us in each of our hearts. Thank you, Larry Gibson. Thank you, Larry. This is not goodbye. This is, you will be with us in our hearts. Thank you, Larry. Virginia. Today we're going to hear a lot of wonderful things about Larry Gibson. He meant a lot of, he wore a lot of different hats in this movement. And time does not allow us to say everything that we want to say. I would just like to say that Larry was a true leader, and as a true leader, either whether he knew it or didn't know it, he left a lot of true leaders behind. It is very important to recognize your role and step up and stand your ground firmly. With all of us together, we can surely win this. Thank you. Junior Walk. Uh, I'm a speaker with the Mountain Foundation. Larry Gibson was a close friend of mine and a big inspiration to me, everything that I do in my life. And it, it's hard for me, as I'm sure it's hard for every one of y'all now, that, that he's gone. But Larry knew that this fight was about more than just strip mining, it was about more than just coal. It's about an area that has been impoverished and oppressed for the past 150 years by people with money and power. 
And he, he, know, he knew that to, to do something about that, that we're all going to have to band together and we're all going to have to take leadership positions and we're all going to have to fight this. Not fight it harder, but fight it as hard as we can. You know, from now on, in the name of Larry, we have to fight as hard as we can until we end this. We have too many dead heroes in this movement. I have too many dead friends. We can't afford another one. We need to end this as soon as we can. And if we can all come together and fight as hard as Larry did, we can pull it off. I know we can. All right, well, that's about all I got to say. Thank you guys very much. Hi everybody, I'm Ann Lee, I'm from Tennessee, and I want to say, hey buddy, and hey buddy to everybody out there, because that's the way Larry always said hello to his friends. I've got a lot of memories of Larry, as everybody here does, um, of walking down the streets of New York in the halls of the UN, walking down the streets of DC and in the Capitol halls. One of my favorite memories is going into a, a meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers, and there were several of us in the meeting. They were only giving us an hour, so we we're each supposed to have about five minutes to speak. Larry went first, and about 35 minutes later, when he broke to take a breath, the rest of us were able to continue taking our meeting. But in that entire time that Larry was speaking, all of the officers of the Army Corps of Engineers were wrapped with what Larry was saying, because what he was saying was real, sincere, and from the heart. And that was Larry. That's the way Larry worked. That's the way he fought. And that's the way the rest of us are going to have to fight. We've heard to fight harder, which we need to do. We will continue to do. We need to fight together. We need to fight smarter. And we need to continue fighting for Larry, for Judy, for everyone in Central Appalachia who's having to deal with the scourge of surface coal mining, mountaintop removal, and any of the extractive processes that are killing us right now. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Jan Osha. Um, and I'm going to sing Go Rest High Upon the Mountain. The words to the chorus are in your program, and I know lots of you probably know them. Please sing with me. Um, there is a misprint. It should be love, not look. Love for the Father and the Son. Um, Larry inspired me to inspire others to believe in myself enough to help people see um, that beautiful part of themselves as well. This is for him. He loved the whistle. I'm going to play it first on a whistle and then we'll sing it together.
Sun your work on earth is done. Go to heaven shouting. Love for I could see the angels' faces when they hear your sweet voice sing. Sing with me, please. Go as high upon the mountain, sun your work on earth is done. It's an honor and privilege to uh, commemorate the life of a man so short in stature, yet such a giant of integrity, courage, and love. I'll be reading uh, the first six verses uh, in a paraphrase of Psalm 24 in just a moment, but I want to go back seven weeks ago, Saturday, August 25th. Uh, Larry was getting ready for the following week's Labor Day Gospel Festival. Uh, John Murdoch, who's out here from Washington, D.C., and I came up to the mountain to help Larry out, clean up the place, get ready. And we came to the White Rock, you know, it's before you get to the, uh, the shelter, and here they was with his brush cutter, cutting a uh, uh, brush. Uh, uh, and and he, we stopped, and he said, he pointed up to the top of the hill, and he said, see those two crosses up there? Yes, uh, well, there's three. I want to clear that so that they all can be seen from the road. So we got our brush cutters and chainsaws, and we worked all morning and afternoon clearing that brush. At the end of the day, as we sat up by these three large white uh, concrete crosses, and we talked, a, Larry talked a while to us, John and I uh, were there. He talked about how he had to uh, go to the doctor the next week. He didn't want to go. He was tired of this. And, but he talked about all the sick people that lived in that area. These people are getting sick, which is why I'm so passionate about uh, the need for legislation, such as the AK Act, to, to end mountaintop removal. Larry uh, then pointed down to the bottom of the hill and he said, you know, many, many decades ago, there was a church there, Caper Church. You know, it's been burned down or whatever for decades. But he said, you know, the people who lived there prayed, cared about this place, and they would, at the end of the, after a church service, they walk up to the top of the hill, the highest place in that area, and, and, and pray around these crosses. Larry had such a care, an, an, an honoring respect for the ancestors, the people who went before him, and such a hope in the new generation that they would work, as Ken said, for justice and truth. He had a covenant kind of understanding. Um, values of home, and belonging, integrity, destination, interconnectedness. And that, that God's creation, the mountains, the streams, air, the creatures, give us life. And these are too precious to degrade at any price. And many of you heard at times 
what in your life is so precious that it is not for sale. Larry changed my life, and I believe there are many here who could say Larry Gibson changed my life. So this Psalm 24, 1 through 6 is uh, in uh, something that I, I just reminds me so much of Larry Gibson. It begins with a statement, a question, and then a response. The earth belongs to God and all that is in it, the world and all life upon it. For God has founded it on the seas and established it on the streams. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord and who shall stand in the holy place of God? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not let their souls become corrupt, who do not speak deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God who saves. Such is the company of those who seek the face of God. Larry has ascended the mountain of the Lord.
Someone has saved my life here. I am asked to make an announcement, so maybe I can get all the emotion into that and then talk about Larry but, uh, without breaking down. There's a signature book out in the hall for Larry's family for all of you to sign during the intermission. It's at the table with the flowers and a uh, picture of Larry and the group at Caveford Mountain. So uh, during intermission, please go there and, and sign the book. Uh, back in 1999, I joined Larry in the walk from Harper's Ferry to uh, Fayetteville. And then he, he finished it with other people after that, and a whole bunch of people joined us, and there's a lot of people here that walked with us. And uh, I got to know him real well. Uh, when you're with somebody day and night for a couple months, uh, you, you become brothers, or you hate each other. <laughs> well, we became brothers. And he only has one major fault, and I won't tell you that unless you're a very good friend. So, <laughs> otherwise, he was perfect. Uh, he, how, how could this little guy take on the evil empire that was doing the most destructive man-made environmental damage in the whole world? This little guy about five feet tall with very little formal education felt about the mountains the same as I did. And I wanted, I wanted to read something here that reminds me of Larry. This came from the Unitarian Universalist Bulletin the other day. I am but a drop of water. Alone I would disappear, dried up by the scorching sun or sucked up by the dry, thirsty earth. But together, we can wear out stones, carve out the Grand Canyon, and make streams and rivers. Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Annie Jane Cotton, and Larry Gibson was my friend. I rarely met another person who fought this fight with such passion and integrity and love. He didn't do this work to be famous or win awards. He did it because it came from a place deep inside of him and because it hurt him to see what was happening to these mountains. And I want to tell you a story. So Larry was a lot of things and he was you know, obviously well known, but he was also funny and kind and a terrible driver. <laughs> One of the scariest drivers I've ever been in a car with. <laughs> um, and there was, there was a moment during the march on Blair Mountain, and a lot of people thought that was a crazy thing and we shouldn't do it. And, and there was a moment a day when we, we ended the march early because it was raining so hard and we didn't want people to get hurt. And I rode back with Larry, and of course he was driving crazy, gesturing and yelling the whole way as he's wont to do when he gets passionate. Um, and he just kept saying over and over, are y'all serious? Are you going to see this through? We got to do this if we're going to do it. And, and Larry, we are serious.
You guys, we think great people need a great introduction. And I think the woman behind the man needs an introduction. I was always taught behind every good man was a good woman. Well, I've never known a sweeter, most humble human being in my life besides Carol Gibson. Their love was an inspiration to me, and I'm sure it was an inspiration to us all. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce Carol Gibson. would like to dedicate to Carol to put up on Larry's cabin and it says these solar panels are dedicated to the keepers of the mountains, Larry Gibson. We all are mountain keepers now. Here, Carol. Um, we want to thank Carol, Lil Larry, Victoria, and Cameron for sharing Larry with us. So we tried to come up with something special. So we had a book put together and some pictures of memories of Larry and what he meant to us. Stevens and Paul kind of helped me with this. But we have a picture. These leaves are from the mountain. And it's a picture of you and Larry. And Paul searched for a quote. I don't ever look at her. Look at her. And she don't flow for me. Larry to Carol. We love you.
My name is Adam Hall. I'm a speaker with the Keeper of the Mountains Foundation. I sat up on top of the mountain yesterday, wrestling with the ideas of what, what story would sum up my experiences with Larry. And then I realized that there was never just a that moment. Wherever we were, no matter how many times I listened to him, the end result was me ready to jump out of my seat and take action. We shared some adventures, whether it was Larry speeding down I-77 and me grabbing onto the Oh My God bar, or whether it was we were out in Colorado and I'm sitting in the back of a crowd saying, no, Larry, don't hit that coal executive with the microphone. <laughs> Or when we're in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, he gets his stories mixed up. I'm sitting here beside him one time and he says, after his really grand introduction, he sits up there and he's stroking his chin, you see, and he looks at the crowd like I am right now and he goes, I want to tell you about the tsunami of Appalachia. I had a three-legged fox. <laughs> and he paused. And everybody was like, As I spent more time with Larry, we bonded like brothers. We always called each other when we could, always made sure each of us were taken care of, and we were always sure to tell each other how much we appreciate each other. We never stopped laughing, which is the one lesson that I've taken from him that I will always keep with me till the day I die. That without laughter, without those bad jokes, we will never, we cannot make it in this movement. And trust me, that phrase holds no greater truth than right now. I am sad to say goodbye to a friend. And I just wish that I could thank him for all that he did for me when I was at my lowest. But I am reminded of what a good friend told me. Shed your tears and swing twice as hard. <laughs> and though I will never be done shedding those tears, I am ready to lace those gloves up one more time for Larry. I cannot wait to the day that I see him on another plane with my head held high saying, we did it, buddy. We did it, because we are all, all the keepers of the mountains, and it is now all up to us to make sure that that dream lived daily. Larry Vision comes true. When the boot is lifted off the people he loved in all extraction communities, we will see that day come. Thank you. Larry Gibson was plain and simply one of the finest human beings I ever knew. And he always asked for this song, so we'll sing it for him one more time. And the words to the chorus are in your in, in the back of the book. Leaves are falling and turning in showers of cold as the postman clouds up our long hair. And there's sympathy written all over his face 
as he hands me a couple stories about Larry today. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to get through this. And uh, like Bill DiPaolo, I'm going to try to do it in a little less than an hour. Maybe an hour and three minutes. I spent a lot of time with Larry, particularly in the last few months, up on the mountain. And um, spent a whole day with him a couple of days before he passed. And I remember as I drove off the mountain that day, there was just something that overcame me. And I felt like I had just spent a lifetime with him. We had a lot of really deep conversations that day, and I'd like to share some of the things that we talked about. We talked about mistakes. You know, it's not a matter that any of us are going to go through life without making any mistakes. 
because we all will, we all have. The question is, what do we do with those mistakes? If we learn from those mistakes, we don't have to trip over them anymore. But if we ignore them, we're going to stumble over them over and over again. So learning from our mistakes allows us to transform those stumbling blocks into stepping stones. And those stepping stones will be something to take us over and around the perils that we're facing. There's a few activists in this room today. I, I think I've seen a few of you out there somewhere. <laughs> Funny thing about us activists, you know when we perceive an injustice, we're pretty quick to stand up, is that right? And the issues that we're facing right now are very serious indeed. The threats around us are, um, are very real. So jumping up to respond to these threats is a good thing. Is anybody out there today willing to stand up? Anybody? Who's going to stand up? I knew there were a few of you out there. I could tell it. I'm going to get, talk to you now about something that sometimes we need to change our perspective. And we need to look at things from a different place. Larry and I were talking about Rosa Parks, and I said, you know, we can learn a lot from Rosa Parks. Anybody remember her? It feels good to say Rosa Parks, and Larry gives it in the same sentence, doesn't it? Like Rosa, uh, Larry Gibson, Rosa Parks was also very passionate and committed and firm in her beliefs. But I think the biggest thing that I learned from Rosa Parks was that sometimes the best way to stand up for what you believe is to simply sit down. Think about that for a minute. The greatest thing Rosa Parks did was just take a seat quietly on that bus. Now I want to ask you if there's anybody in this room that's willing to sit down for what you believe in. Just throw a hand up or something, anybody? As I mentioned before, the threats and the harms to us are very real. But I want to talk about one insidious threat that most of us in this movement have fallen prey to, and that is simply the threat of division. Now the powers that be have always known that the easiest way to conquer a people is to divide them. And there's nowhere that that's more apparent than this country, where our own government waged a genocide against the Native American people. And nowhere today is that truth more evident. The power of the tactic of division is no more evident anywhere else today than in the same soil right here in Appalachia in this movement. We've become divided, folks. We've become divided by fear, and we've become divided by our egos. Now that's a lot to say, I know, and I'm probably not going to be popular. I hope nobody's waiting for me with that microphone out back to beat me. <laughs> but it's an irrationality and an unconscious thing that we've given into where we have come to believe that other folks in this movement are our enemies. We feel threatened by the work of others. We feel threatened by the notoriety of others. Or we simply just don't agree with their path. But you know, throughout the ages, there have always been wise people who have come to us and they've said something along the lines of, there are many paths but one truth. We have one truth here. We need to remember that. The threats that we're facing right now 
from coal and other fossil fuels are more than simply threats to our water, our community, our waddles, our health, and our quality of life. They're more than just a threat to our future. For with a finite resource and a voracious appetite, we have no future. We are eating and superheating the very thing that gives us life, and we have become a cancer upon our Mother Earth. The threats that we face now are more than just to our present, because we have no quality of life when we have no justice and we have no peace. And all our days and hours are spent fighting poverty, pollution, sickness, corruption in the government, corruption in the corporations, and yes, even fighting with one another. Even our past is threatened because we cannot honor a heritage we don't remember or a heritage that's been sullied and censored by those who control us with lies and misinformation. All these threats combined, and it's easy to see that we've been lulled by an anthem that proclaims that our past is more important than our future. And as you can see, we're under siege from all sides. Any strategist or even common sense will tell you that putting all of our efforts in one direction leaves everything else vulnerable. Dispersing ourselves makes us weak. We, have that, we don't have that strength in number when we're all scattered. Psychologists tell us that anger is hurt turned inward. Now we've all heard the joke about the hillbilly firing squad. And in case you haven't heard it, it's terribly politically incorrect, but I'm gonna share it with you. And that's where a bunch of us get together and we stand in a circle facing inward and we take aim and we fire. I'm not telling you that to be funny because I never found that joke funny. But sadly, it's far too often our reality. We have become divided because we're too quick to stand up and criticize, because we're too quick to stand up and ridicule, because we're too quick to stand up and say someone else's way is wrong and our, only our way will work. We need to learn from Rosa Parks. We need to learn when to sit down to achieve our goals. We need to sit down and listen before we leap. We need to sit down and have a cup of coffee and open and honest conversations. We need to sit down with our neighbors and appreciate them for what they offer rather than that demand that they fit into our schemes. We need to sit down for a moment and be still and know what we are and that we are. There are indeed many paths, but only one truth. We cannot honor our path until we respect the paths of those who struggle with us. What does this have to do with Larry Gibson? Simply this, of all the words Larry spoke to me, the most memorable words were the ones that he said to me so many years ago. We need to remember that the fight in front of us is far bigger and far more important than any fight between us. We have lost a dear friend, but let's remember his words lest we lose our way. I encourage each of us, let's learn from our mistakes Let's forgive ourselves. Let's forgive one another. And I want to welcome each of you to come and sit a spell. Thank you, Larry.
Alan Johnson when he was talking about the crosses on uh, Cape Fear Mountain reminded me of someone who once said that we need those crosses on the mountain as long as there are people being crucified in the valleys. Two readings, one from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before the Lord with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? The Lord has told you, immortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The second reading comes from uh, a poem by Grace Cavallari called Letter. If you ask us what brings us here, staring out of our lives like animals in high grass, I'd say it was what we had in common with the other. The hum of a song we believe in which can't be heard, the sound of our own luminous bodies rising just beyond the hill, and the dream of a light which won't go out, and a story we're never finished with. We talk of things we cannot comprehend so that you'll know about the inner and outer world which are the same. Someone has to be with us in this, and if you are then, you know us best. And I mean all of us. The deer who leaves his marks behind him in the snow, the red fox moving through the woods, the same stream in them as in us too, although we are the chosen ones who speak. Please tell me what you think cannot be sold, and I will say that is all that there is. The pain in our lives, the love we have, we bring you these small seeds. Do what you can with them. What is found in this beleaguered and beautiful land is what we write of. I'm going there because of people. To people just like me, my dad was a miner. I was a seed of the coal miner. I was expected to go to the mine behind my father. Nobody asked me. I was expected. That's what it was for me. That's why young people are in the coal field. But I ain't had enough consciousness about me to change my own direction. You people leave here today, you better get out there and start telling the people the truth. And tell them that coal kills. As long as you're calling for the fact that I'm not against coal, I'm just against mountaintop removal, then you're calling for continuation of annihilation of Appalachia and its people. Why? They're just stupid evil hillbillies. Don't matter. You're expendable. We call them collateral damage. That's what the government would say to us. We are collateral damage. I am not collateral damage. I am not a victim either. I am not a victim or collateral damage. Or oh, I am not a sacrifice loan either. I'm somebody. I deserve everything that the very wealthy and rich people have. Quality life. That's what I want. Wealth I already have in my land. I've been watching them destroy this land for some 25 years and more. All my damn life, code been doing something to my people. Not my responsibility by myself to stop this a charge. Come up with a better way. Get jobs for these people. If our damn governor won't do it, then it's Jaws' position to do it. And some people say, it's not our position to get these people jobs. But when the governor in West Virginia ain't doing it, I say it is our position to get these people jobs, to give them a choice. They are still people. And I know the difference of these people who are going into my land is my people. Simply because they have been put in a position where they do 
not have a damn choice. I have people coming out here ready to kill me simply because they're afraid that they don't have a future, no food on the table, and they would kill me. And yes, they're still my people. So come here and take this lady here. I'm not ever been and never will be politically correct here. You're going to get it straight from me. And then after that, I order me to be on the table. We put everything on the table and deal with it. Until we do, it's not going to be the ain't going to fix to it. You can't always agree. We're two different individuals. We each have, you know, our own We both, we both agree on that I'm a, I'm a good-looking fellow, though, don't we? <laughs> That you're a good fellow. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Well, <laughs> Larry's tender-hearted. He, you know, he he has a passion for this land. Uh, that's one thing that drove me to Larry. His heart. I know he has a good heart, and I know he cares what happens. He cares what happens to other people, not just us. But everybody, he's trying to make it better for everybody. But one man can't change the whole world, I tell him that. Good afternoon. In 2001, when I first met Larry, I had just gotten involved after the flood in Dorothy, and everyone was telling me I had to go up to Caford Mountain and meet Larry Gibson. So I went up during one of his events, and I walked up to him and said, Hi, I'm Bill Price. I'm just getting involved, Larry, and I'll be working with Cole River and uh, see what we can do. And he looked up at me and he said, Where the hell you been? <laughs> That was Larry. He was, he just had this sense of urgency about him. He had high expectations of everyone. Whether you be a student or an environmentalist or a nationally known politician, including the President of the United States, or you were just known at your local bar. He expected you not to waste his time, not to come to Cape and Mountain, look and go, oh my God, look how bad it is, and go back home and do nothing. What he wanted you to do was come to Cape and Mountain, leave and do something, anything. He wanted you to go back and organize. As Larry, from the very beginning, understood the power of organizing. Some people think it, Larry Gibson was about Larry Gibson, pickup truck, t-shirt you could see from a mile away, a cell phone, and a little model of a mountain in a box. In the early days, that was a lot of what Larry Gibson was. But what I saw over the last several years with Larry was, in, Organizations got together like OVAC and Co River and Sierra Club and others got together and were able to get some money for Larry to hire some staff people and start this program that you see, the Keepers of the Mountain. He began to realize that if we're going to win, we have to do more than just work hard. If we're going to win, we have to do more than just do good work. But if we're going to win the battles that are facing Appalachia, We've got to go out, find new people to bring into this movement, help them reach their potential, and let them empower themselves to go do something. He realized the power of organizing. Larry had a vision for Appalachia. I was thinking yesterday when we were on Caford Mountain that so many of us take people up to Kayford or we go up to Kayford ourselves and we focus on the devastation and the destruction that surrounds the top of the mountain. But when Larry Gibson went to the mountain, he went home. He understood and, and, and realized the destruction was there and talked about it. But what Larry focused on was the 50 acres that he was able to preserve on the top of that mountain. 
who was recently able to spend part of a day on an unspoiled mountain looking over an unfilled valley, talking about futures, individual futures and the future of Appalachia. And I realized that Larry's vision was a place where people could enjoy peace and love and good health in their homes and in their communities. He used to say, what's so dear to you that you will dedicate your life to protect? He wanted people to realize that Appalachia was worth preserving, was worth giving your life for, worth making sacrifices for, and that people's lives would be more fulfilled if mountain top removal were stopped and Appalachia had justice. Today there's grief, but there's also that sense of urgency still. And we can take that sense of urgency, be grateful for the work that everyone is doing, quit bashing each other and start working together, realize the power of organizing, have that vision for a better Appalachia, then we can truly carry on the work that Larry did for so many years. And we can truly celebrate the life of Larry Gibson. The keeper of the mountain is God, but we are all keepers of the mountain. Today we mourn, but we will work to continue. And we won't agonize, but we will organize and we will win. Thank you. Good afternoon all, my name is Mary Ann Hitt. I live in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, with my family, and this is my daughter, Hazel. I am the director of the Beyond Coal Campaign at the Sierra Club. Hazel is an 11th generation West Virginian. It's very cute when she's been hearing people say West Virginia in the speeches, she'll look at me and say, West Virginia, West Virginia. Hazel met Larry a couple of times, and although she was a little bit too young to remember it, someday I look forward to telling her that when she was a little baby, that she met a real-life American hero, and that, <laughs> and that her mama had the privilege of working beside him to save some mountains and streams for her and for all of the other kids in West Virginia. One of my great friends and mentors, Lenny Combe of Appalachian Voices, once gave me the advice that when you start a campaign to change the world in some way, that one of the first things that you should do is start planning your victory party. That's because you are in it to win and you need to act like it from the very beginning. I have to tell you, I always imagined that when we won the fight to end mountaintop removal, I just assumed that Larry Gibson would be at our victory party. I never imagined that we would lose Larry before we finished the job, and I still can't quite believe it. I keep, I keep looking around all these fluorescent green shirts, thinking I see him, and, uh, or thinking maybe I'm gonna see him at the next rally or the next time I'm up on Cayford Mountain. I bet a lot of you are feeling the same way. And I've been wondering if I feel that way partly because Larry, is here tonight and he will never leave us because he changed the lives of every single person in this room and lots and lots of other people who could not be here today. I now have the great privilege of working on coal and clean energy issues and campaigns all around the United States. And as I was thinking about Larry and his legacy, I realized that he may have single-handedly brought more people to this work than any other person I have ever known. If you ever stood at the edge of Cayford Mountain, if you ever heard him speak, if you ever stood shoulder to shoulder with him at a protest or a hearing or a rally, your life simply was never going to be the same. Larry also had a big influence on the Sierra Club. He spoke to our board, he spoke to our staff, and those presentations that he gave were 
One of the main reasons the Sierra Club made mountaintop removal and environmental justice national priorities. And he also inspired a lot of the people who are part of the Sierra Club, including a couple of our national leaders who are here in the audience today to pay their respects. Our national field director, Bob Bingaman, and our national environmental justice director, Leslie Fields. And finally, Larry meant so much to me. He was, he was a North Star. When the going got tough, and as we all know, and as many people have alluded to, the going can get very tough in this movement. Just hang in there, Hazel. He was always there with a word of encouragement, a word of wisdom, a hug, a joke. Do you want to get down? And when the path to victory seemed like it was blocked by a giant boulder, Larry would just roll up his sleeves and figure out some way around it. And when the energy of us veteran activists invariably started to flag, Larry just kept bringing in new people, new blood, new energy, new passion to this movement. And a lot of that new blood and new energy and passion is right here in this room today, thankfully. I miss Larry every day, and I don't think anything will ever fill the hole that he has left in my heart. I just hope that we can all channel our grief and our sadness at losing Larry into breathing new life into the fight to end mountaintop removal. Because I think that when we finally have our victory party, and in all of the days leading up to it, Larry will be there in spirit. He's gonna be carried in the hearts and the souls of thousands of us who are gonna keep working every day to end mountaintop removal, heal Appalachia, and move America to clean energy. I can think of no finer tribute to Larry Gibson. So I will see you all at the victory party. One thing, Dad did get the last laugh on this and the last word, and they definitely ain't taking him off the mountain now. He's there for all times, and he's always going to be in everybody's heart here. Uh, if it wasn't for Carol Gibson, uh, right after they got married, it seemed like Dad got a jetpack put on his back. <laughs> Uh, but uh, they were totally in love with each other. They still are. They will be forever. As one great woman sitting right there in the second row. You know, I used to go to the mountain every year when I was young. The church was still there. We used to camp out there with my Uncle Billy and my dad. And, you know, I got one uncle left, Uncle Harry. And, I don't want him to go nowhere. I love him to death. Wish he'd come down and visit me more often. But I'm going to not sit down, lay down, or let people push me around. I tell you something, I'm going to be here. Mount Keepers is going to be here. We ain't going nowhere. You know, my dad told me just a couple weeks ago, he said, Larry, son, I'm going to die doing something on this mountain. Well, he died doing something he, he, he wanted to do, he loved to do. He was up there all the time. I said, Dad, you need to slow down. <laughs> That's like trying to speak to a rock. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. They don't need to dig no coal. I tell you, Dad had so much energy. <laughs> All they needed to do was hook him up to the grid. <laughs> so let's do my father proud and keep fighting. Don't lay down. Don't sit down. Don't get pushed around. 
Thank you. hard to follow. <laughs> um, my tremendous gratitude, um, my eternal thanks to the family for letting us borrow Larry Gibson and for letting each person in this room experience what a wonderful place Kayford Mountain is. One of the stories, uh, and, and I like to tell a story that would continue to make you smile every time you see something, you'll, you'll know there's a little behind the scenes story. Burning the Future is a film that Larry Gibson and I was in together. And we were filming in Times Square. And uh, we had to be at a certain level in order to get the shot of the ridiculous lights in Times Square. And uh, we, we couldn't get Larry up high enough. So when you see that film, keep in mind that Larry Gibson is standing on a stack of magazines. <laughs> I did a lot of traveling with Larry and I really enjoyed uh, every minute of it. There was never a boring minute. Um, and I experienced some times with Larry that uh, will will continue to influence me for the rest of my life. There was three men that influenced Maria Gano in this world, and that was my dad, my grandfather, and Larry Gibson. <laughs> the last conversation that I had with Larry Gibson was in a conference call. And it was, a, we were planning the Mountain Heroes event. And something that it was very important for everyone to hear that Larry had to say on this call. And it was very important. He wanted folks to hear this. We have to get the youth involved. We have to get the young people standing up the next generation is who will end this. Let's hope that it ends in Ken Heckler's life. But let's see to it that it ends in our lifetimes. We have a struggle ahead of us. And Larry Gibson will take every step of that struggle with us. Judy Bonds will take every step of that struggle with us. Jim Foster will take that every step of that struggle. Winnie Fox, so many others that have left before us, they walk with us. And when we sat down, they sat with us. And when we sat too long, they say, get off your ass. Thank you tremendously, Larry Gibson for filling this room with people that you've inspired. If Larry Gibson inspired you, raise your hand. I need not say any more, thank you. sing this song. It's uh, Psalm 23, and uh, I put some music to it, and uh, it's amazing affirmation of life, and uh, I especially like to dedicate this to Larry's uh, family.
Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever, He restores my soul, my soul, my soul. He restores my soul. He restores my soul, my soul, my soul. He restores my soul. Good afternoon, y'all. I invite you to look in your program to the audience participation sheet because you are going to participate with me in a minute. And while you are doing that, I'll tell you why I chose the particular psalm and the responsive reading that I did. It's because in 2007, when I was newly back to this state, I grew up here, you know have roots that go back to the late 1700s here. But I left here. And when I came back in 2007, two of the most important people that I met were Abe Moira, wherever he is floating around here, and Larry Gibson. And between those two, and my enthusiasm for faith community involvement, 
in the mountaintop removal issues because I was also a newly ordained Presbyterian pastor, we put together a prayer service on Kayford Mountain. Over a hundred people attended that service. It was one of the first things I'd gotten involved in as a new activist. <laughs> Never thought I'd be one of those, but there I was. Thanks to people like Abe and Larry and so many others. And so I want to repeat one of the things that was used that day. It's this responsive reading from Psalm 65. So please join me. Praise is due to you, O you who answer prayer. To you, all flesh shall come. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. You silence the roaring of the seas and the tumult of the peoples. You visit the earth and water it. The river of God is full of water. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. Creation is longing to shout and sing together for joy. Amen. And thank you, Larry.
so nice to see everybody here. Um, I'm Janet Keating and I'm with OVIC. And Carol, Victoria, Larry, Junior, Cameron, again, want to thank you for sharing Larry with us. He served on OVEC's board for 12 years. And I remember when Larry was the first really outspoken person on this issue of mountaintop removal. And I want to thank you for sharing him with us. He was so generous with his time. And, um, and he learned, and we all saw that in this work that personal growth wasn't optional. We saw Larry grow by leaps and bounds in this work. And in fact, you know, early on, he would be calling OVAC or talking to me or talking to Diane and needing something or talking to Laura. And by the end of it, the last few years, I would be calling him and the words he would say, and I can hear his voice when he says this, what can I do for you, young lady? How can I help you, young lady? Those words echo. Larry actually did turn the whole notion of power and leadership on its head. I loved it. And I, I thought, I just loved hearing what, what Bill DiPaolo had to say about that, so I'm just going to let that lie. It's amazing to me. Um, God was in that, believe me. I believe that with all my heart. Um, I'm the executive director at OVEC, and I know what it takes, and others in this room knows what it takes to win work, to win the kinds of issues we're fighting. Dedicated people like Larry Gibson really can make a huge impact. All the people in this room have already made a huge impact, but I'm also very practical about this work. I have to be practical because that's my job. It takes two things, it takes people, and it takes money. And I've done this before, and I'm going to do it again here today, is I'm going to ask all of you to open your hearts and open your wallets. Yep, I'm asking you during this. It feels a little like church, right? It does. We're celebrating a life here. And so I'm going to ask you to open your hearts, open your wallets, and there are going to be some bright hats coming around. And if you don't have any money with you today, I bet you can pick up one of these envelopes out there in the uh, entryway and make sure that Larry's dream is carried forward. We're all in this together. It takes a lot to get this work done. And my friend, Abe Moira, is going to tell you about the Larry Gibson Memorial Fund. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we, we decided we would tag team this because Janet is really good at asking for money. And so I'm going to try to be as dry as possible and just get, get through this. I, um, my name is Abraham. I'm on the, I'm on the board. And uh, uh, Larry made a big impact on my life. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of my life you know, dedicating it to, to his vision. Um, we. Uh, Early, early board meetings, we um, we really struggled with how, how do you how do you build a program around what, you know around the work that Larry had been doing for you know at that time it had or you know been decades 20, 25, 20 more you know, or more years um, and uh, and so most of you all know Keepers of the Mountains has two main two main programs one is the over the road uh, program it's a speakers program. You've seen a lot of those speakers up here tonight. There's even more that, than, than I think, you know, I can't, I can't even remember the number of them. It's a continually growing program. And the other piece of it, I mean, again, kind of along with what Larry had done um, in terms of saving uh, Caveward Mountain, is to try to, to, try to replicate that um, among other people who have land that they want to save from, from the coal industry. That we, that we, you know, Larry had really created a, um, a, uh, you know, potential strategy here uh, for that 50 acres. Larry and the family did, right? In terms of protecting that land, but can we can we build a program out of that to kind of, you know, give give uh, give the fight against mountaintop removal some toeholds um, around the ar around the state? Um, so we the the donation that we're we're asking, you know, fr from you today is. Uh, is to go to the to the Larry Gibson Memorial Fund, 
which um, we've just started. You know, it's um, it's to memorialize his his life and to kind of be able to push the work forward. Um, the, 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 that fund will specifically be used for to cover all the costs here and, and we've already had such generosity come to the organization um, from, from our allies. M most of this celebration is already paid for, but whatever is left, that money will be used for this and to, um, to outfit Kayford Mountain with, with solar panels. It's actually a three-stage pro three project um, to, to bring solar power to the, to the mountain and also to, to bring potable water to the mountain. Um, we're actually gonna, gonna use the model for water that um, you know, Larry, Larry discovered in the Amazon. So we're gonna use that same technology that they use in the Amazon and bring it to Cape Horn Mountain. Three stages. Um, we, I'm gonna tell you the budget that we put in the grant. It was just a little over 50K, $50,000 um, to do all that work. That grant brought in 18,000 already. Um, we have 30 solar panels sitting in a in a in a shed somewhere in the in the Canal Valley region. Um, so the solar panels are here. We have a big chunk of money that we're going to move forward with, but we need people to be generous. Um, we we want to we we want to imagine a tour at Cape Ford Mountain where people you know start out with with you know with that you know with that home place kind of saved um, and showing the showing the alternative really really living the alternative before you take people out to see how they've destroyed the rest of the mountains um, that it'll be part of the tour it'll be part of what people learn is that we can actually do this sustainably right you can have a home place on top of a mountain and and, and save it um, and then we're going to reach out and, and build our heritage home place uh, program to other other folks who have land similar to that that piece of land where the you know the mineral rights are separated from the surface rights, and so the coal company gets more rights than you do. But um, I'm sorry, I was trying to be short and dry. Um, yeah, give give to the Larry Gibson Memorial Fund. Um, we we're we're moving forward. Thank you.